All right, good morning. So here exciting day of CENG 3306, um, Mechanics and Materials. So let's see, um, today we're going to cover lessons 11 and 12. In lesson 11, um, we're first uh, for the first portion of the lesson, we're going to look at um, thin wall pressure vessels. That is what uh, section that is what lesson 11 will be about and this will be uh, we're covering material that's in section 8.1 in the textbook and we're going to first the, the learning objectives for this uh, set are to determine if a vessel is, is a thin wall pressure vessel uh, calculate hoop and longitudinal stress for both, for both cylindrical and spherical thin wall pressure vessel and then finally use more circle to determine to determine the stresses on any other plane using the principles of combined loading that we've seen before so let's get started. So thin walled pressure vessels. <clears throat> so we'll need to define what a, so we're going to define what a thin pressure, thin walled pressure vessel is and discuss the implications of that assumption. So the word of the day today is thin walled pressure vessels. Thin walled pressure vessels. Well, the name kind of gives it away. It's a pressure vessel. In other words, a, a vessel, a container, a device to resist pressure, either internal or external, although usually we're resisting internal pressure. Unless you're dealing with something like a submarine, then you might have external pressure. Um, and thin walled, meaning thin wall. Okay, so let's discuss that. So, although usually in the cases of civil and mechanical engineering, um, submarines and spacecraft aside, we're usually dealing with, well, even spacecraft is internal pressure, I suppose. The only case we're dealing greatly with external pressure usually is um, things like submarines and submerged fluid and vessels and submerged fluids and things like that. So usually we're dealing with internal pressure. Boilers, pressurized pipelines, things like that. Think loaded with pressurized fluid. And this could be any number of things. We could have, say, like a water pipeline under a great deal of water pressure. Um, we could have an oil pipeline, a gas pipeline. Base, any kind of tubing or a spherical tank or cylindrical tank or any number of things that will um, resist internal pressure. And this internal pressure that it must resist is actually the gauge pressure. It's the difference between the internal and the external pressure. So if there is, um, if your tank has, a, it has an internal pressure of one atmosphere and, and outside the tank there's a, there's a external pressure of one atmosphere, the walls of the tank themselves will not have to carry any uh, stress. But uh, anyway, usually you're dealing with pressures much greater than one atmosphere inside the tank. So let us first discuss what we mean by a thin walled pressure vessel. So I'm going to draw another lovely 3D diagram. So let's consider we have, a, say we have a cross section of a pipe or some sort of cylindrical pressure vessel. Man, that is a terrible drawing. Oh well. That should come more toward here and where did I get that? And there, perfect cylindrical pipe. Okay, so we have this kind of, uh, first of all, consider a stress element on this here. And I'm going to call this A. Stress element A. And on this stress block, we have the following. We have um, two stresses, what we might call our coordinate stresses. This is some, these are basically our X and Y stresses. Except for the case of, um, of pressure vessels, we're going to say sigma L for sigma longitudinal and sigma H for sigma hoop. So we have hoop stress and longitudinal stress. Then I'm going to label uh, two different uh, radii. 
RI for inner radius and RO for outer radius. And the difference between these is going to be T. Okay, so note something to be aware of. As the inner radius decreases, um, sorry, as T decreases, as the thickness decreases, as T decreases, um, our inner becomes approximately equal to our outer. Our inner is approximately equal to our outer. And the, what's critical about this is if you have a um, if you have a thick walled pressure vessel, which we will look at at another time, um, the pressure, sorry, the stress, if you have a very, say like this system, as it is drawn, this is actually a thick wall pressure vessel as I've drawn it here, but the, um, the stresses on the inner surface would be much different than the stresses on the outer surface just because of the difference in material, uh, the difference in material, basically the difference in radius. Um, is much is, is is very relevant. In other words, this radius is much less than this radius. But as the thickness decreases, our inner approximates our outer. The stresses become approximately the same. So as you get a as the thickness decreases relative to the radius, the inner radius, the stresses on the the stresses on the inside surface and the outside surface approximate each other to the point that we can treat them as identical. So and, and so um, you might ask what exactly is OK, so you say a thin wall pressure vessel, but what how do we actually define a thin wall pressure vessel? Is it the thickness is a hundredth of the radius? Is it a thousandth? How do we actually define this criteria? Well, as a good rule of thumb, what we're going to use for this class. Criteria for thin wall pressure vessels. The criteria we're going to use is as, as follows. Um, if if our inner divided by the thickness is greater than or equal to 10, then it will be considered a uh, thin wall pressure vessel. Um, this thick criteria provides for approximately provides for approximately uniform stress throughout the thickness. Uh, greater than or equal to 10, yeah. It provides for approximately equal stress throughout the, throughout the thickness. And when you actually do a higher level analysis, say like a finite element or um, or a more pre or a more uh, precise um, algebraic analysis, you will find that this assumption is actually pretty valid. This is um, predicted is within 4% of actual, even at the 10. The greater this number, the more accurate the prediction would be. Um, um, within 4% of actual. So this is actually a fairly reasonable assumption. Okay. So let's consider this. Now, let us first consider longitudinal stress. Longitudinal stress sigma L. Um, although, however, I'm going to look at this for a cylindrical vessel first. Longitudinal stress for a cylindrical vessel. All right, so I'm going to have an, a longitudinal vessel, and I'm going to make a cut on this vessel to expose the internal and external forces cut to expose internal and external forces. And external forces. 
and then I'm going to draw a free body diagram um, associated with that. So let's look at that. I'm going to first draw my um, circle. This will be my inner and my outer. And then this here, and this here, and this is cut like that there. This is just cut, uh, this is just a cut line. Okay, so then I'm going to, sh I'm going to show my two axes. My two axes on here are going to be my longitudinal axis and my um, hoop axis. Basically, the hoop is a radial axis, longitudinal is along the, uh, well, the axis of the member, the axis of the vessel. Okay, so I'm going to have, I'm going to define two areas. Um, I'm going to make one in green and one in um, blue. So consider two areas. Um, first, this one. Area one is the actual area of the material, the actual metal, area of the metal or whatever this is made of. And this is going to be 2 pi um, r i t. Now, you might be, um, you might balk at this. You might say, hey, wait a minute. I know how to find the area of a ring. It's clearly um, pi r squared you know, for the outer one minus the inner one. So you might be saying, what are you trying to pull me on? What are you, what are you trying to pull on me here, Miss Larson? Clearly, this is, there's something very wrong with this. Well, remember, this is a thin walled pressure vessel. This is critical. So in other words, the difference between these is between the, the outer and the inner radiuses is very small. So in other words, we can simply say, um, we can actually treat this as the circumference is uh, just like a length. And we can, we can basically say the area of this is very similar to a rectangle, where the, the, um, where the height of the rectangle is the thickness of the, of the material, and the length of the rectangle is the circumference of the inner radius. So um, that assumption does actually work fairly well. When you have a, uh, again, only when you have a thin-walled vessel or a thin-walled ring. Um, so if you ever have a, um, um, a, a circle with a very thin ring or a hoop or something like that, you can actually calculate its area, its cross-sectional area, fairly accurately just by doing this method. Okay, then I'm going to have another area, which is going to be the area of the inner region. Here. And this area, area 2, is simply going to be pi r internal squared. Then I'm going to have two stresses on here. I'm going to have two different stresses on here. Maybe I'll do one in red and one in orange. So first I'm going to have the stress in the metal itself. And this is going to be pulling from our perspective outward like this. This is the, stre the longitudinal stress in the metal. This is sigma L, sigma L, sigma L, etc. Then I'm going to have a different one, which is the pressure, the P, the actual pressure in the material. Sorry, not the actual pressure in the material, the pressure in the gas or the other fluid. In the gas, in the liquid, in the water, in the oil, in whatever it is. So this here, this is P. P is going into the page, sigma L is coming out of the page. And P is a stress. Well, P is a, uh, is a pressure. It's, it has the same units as stress, though. And if you'd like to learn more about um, uh, fluid, stresses, fluid pressures and things like that, feel free to sign up for my uh, fluid mechanics class. And I can teach you all about um, fluid pressures and all sorts of lovely things like that. Okay, uh, then let's see. 
So now I'm going to do a uh, just I'm going to do a sum of forces in the longitudinal direction. So sum of forces in the longitudinal direction is going to be equal to zero. Okay. So first thing I'm going to have is I'm going to write this out in colors and then I'm going to write it out in um, uh, and then I'm going to just stop doing that because it's going to be a little tedious. Sigma L times um, I'm going to say let's call that area one area one um, and then minus actually let me do something like this and then in black my uh, equals minus um pressure times area two. So if I do a sum of forces, I can simply say the total force in this outer ring is the stress times its area. And the total force generated by the gas is the pressure inside the vessel times the area, times area two, this inner area. Now I'm just going, now I'm going to get away from the colors, so that's going to be, be a bit tedious doing all that. But sigma L now is just, just remains sigma L, and that's ultimately what we're trying to find. Area 1 is 2 pi R internal times T minus P times pi R internal squared equals 0. All right, and so pi goes away and pi goes away, um, and then this R internal goes away and this R internal goes away. And I get that sigma L is equal to P R internal over 2 um, T, like shown. Sigma L equals the pressure times the internal radius over twice the thickness. Um, and we can actually think of this as sigma 2 in terms of our principal stresses. This is also going to be equal to sigma 2 in terms of our principal stresses. Questions on that? Okay, so it's a, a very uh, good simple derivation. Now I want to do the same thing for hoop stresses. So let me do a hoop stress derivation for a cylindrical vessel now. Hoop stress Um, sigma H for a cylindrical vessel. Okay, so let me draw another lovely, perfect, glorious three dimensional diagram. And now, instead of cutting the pipe or the vessel or whatever this thing is, um, you know, that looks really bad. I'm trying to get a circular thing, so let me try to do this better. Instead of cutting this um, transverse, instead of cutting this, say, um, along its uh, transverse to the axis, I'm going to cut along the axis. So I have a cut like this. It looks a little bit better. Not by much, it still looks pretty bad. So I'm going to exaggerate the vertical though here. So I'm going to have a cutoff like this, and then maybe like that. So I'm cutting this thing along the axis of the member. Like this, and I'm going to do the same kind of free body diagram. here. Lovely 3D diagram. Okay, so now I'm going to have two areas again. I'm going to have area one, the area of the walls again, or the area of the walls in the cut anyway, and area one 
is going to be equal to L times T, the length of the section times T, and then area two is the area of the gas that I'm cutting through. I keep saying gas, but it could be any fluid. And this is going to be area two equals two R internal times L. This is R internal, so the length of this the length of this is just L. This is our L here. In fact, let me label that just in case it's not clear. L and maybe our internal and T. Then I'm going to show the forces on here. Um, this is going to be upward, is going to be my sigma H, my hoop stress, sigma H. And then in orange, I will make a um, the pressure, the internal pressure coming downward on this surface, P. So then if I do a, let me do, draw a 2D um, free body diagram. We can look at this and analyze the stresses therein. So let us look at each of these um, sections. Note, area one is the area of just one of the sides of the pipe. So I'm going to have this kind of thing going on here. I'm going to have uh, three forces on here, a downward force, an upward force, and an upward force. Um, this, the stress is here. This one is going to be um, uh, the forces on here. Let me just do, let me do it in terms of forces. This is going to be P. Um, this one is going to be sigma H, sigma H. And these ones are going to, this one's going to be times area two. So P times area two. And then the other ones are going to be times area one. Area one, area one. So if I do a sum of forces in the hoop direction, I don't see that uh, terminology much. Sum of forces in the h direction. This this isn't actually this is not actually a um, horizontal. It's a hoop. Sum of forces in the hoop direction. Um, I'm going to have two sigma h times area one, this one and this one, minus p times a two will be equal to zero. And then um, let's see. I can I can simply say two sigma h. Uh, area one is equal to L times T minus P and area two is equal to two R I L equals zero. And then, um, oh, uh, let's see. R I, okay, yeah, we're good. And then I can cancel a few things out. The L here and the L here, the two and the two are going to cancel out. And then finally, uh, sigma horizontal, or sorry, sigma hoop. Keep on call it horizontal. Sigma H is P times R um, internal over T. Although actually, it probably wouldn't matter whether you use the internal or the external radius on these, because um, again, we're making the assumption that they're effectively the same. So you could, we could actually just call this PR over T if we wanted to. And compare this to this stress here. So first of all, um, let me mention that this one is going to be our uh, sigma one in terms of our principal stresses. But we could also realize that um, sigma horizontal sigma horizontal is equal to two sigma L. So if just looking at the formula here, it's the same exact formula, except, um, uh, let's see, except that the sig the hoops, the, the, sorry, did I say horizontal again? Uh, sorry about that. The, um, we could, it is the exact same formula for the hoop stress and the longitudinal stress, except that the hoop stress is twice the longitudinal stress. 
So from this, we can conclude that hoop stress is actually critical. Hoop stress is critical. Hoop stress is critical. In other words, as long as we have a, um, as long as we have a, um, a material the same, um, same material properties in all directions, the uh, hoop stress, a, a, a pipe or a cylindrical pressure vessel, will always be failing in hoop stress before it fails in longitudinal stress. Okay which is um, why if you've ever seen some pictures of failed pressure vessels, they tend to fail. Um, if you've ever seen pictures of say like a failed uh, ammonia tank or something like that, they tend to fail with like big cracks right here. If this is along the, if this is the axis here, you know, it's a curved end here, maybe a curved end here. They tend to fail with a big crack here because they're being pulled apart by the hoop stress. Now we could probably contrive some scenarios. We could probably, if we dug hard enough, I'm sure we could find some example where it failed via, um, via longitudinal stress. But but generally nine times out of ten, if one of these is going to fail, it's going to fail via hoop stress, unless there's some very particular defect in the material, some very particular damage to, to the object, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let us consider the state of stress. We like to do that, so let's do that. State of stress. Let us consider the state of stress in the material. So I drew that little element A before, and so let's analyze the state of stress on that element. On element A. On element A. So we're going to have two stresses on here, uh, sigma h, the hoop stress, will be equal to what will be our sigma 1 principal stress, and sigma, long, sigma l, single, sigma longitudinal, will be equal to our sigma 2 principal stress. And then, um, let's see, if I, if I want to draw more circle, which I do because I like more circle. It's just so circular. And so now, and this has a particular name. Some people refer to it as simply the Moore circle. Some people refer to it as Moore's circle. I don't know. Six one half dozen the other. Personal preference, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so good old Moore circle here. I am going to have something like this here, and um, so I'm going to have my um, sigma and my ta and my ta. Oh, that's a t, not a ta. And my ta. And I'm going to look something. I'm going to I'm going to get something like this here. So let's look at this. It's going to look something like this. Where we have a tau max. Sigma H equals sigma 1, and sigma L equals sigma 2. Now, um, let's see. Mm. So we can see that our, again, our maximum stress is going to be our, ho our hoop stress. Therefore, it's going to be splitting down the side. Okay. Now, let us look at the um, the uh, spherical vessel. So we have thoroughly analyzed the thin wall um, cylindrical pressure vessel. 
Now let us look at the spherical pressure vessel. There are sometimes cases where you do have spherical vessels. Um, let's see, I believe, uh, what, what's, what's one I've seen before? The, uh, what are those? The uh, cryogenic uh, liquefied natural gas. Those have, those big ships have, uh, the big, the big uh, liquefied natural gas ships, they have in the hull, they have these massive spherical tanks built into the hull. And the reason they do that is simply because it takes, um, well, for a variety of reasons. One, the, um, one of the great difficulties in keeping natural gas a liquid is obviously keeping it chilled. And a, um, the cooling requirements will inevitably, will inevitably be proportional to the surface area of your, um, of your vessel. And a, a, a sphere, obviously, you've probably heard before, has the, um, is the most efficient shape for holding volume in relation to surface area. So if you use a spherical vessel, you'll have actually much less um, area for the same volume than if you were to use a um, cylindrical pressure vessel. The reason cylindrical pressure vessels are more common, uh, especially for many industrial applications, residential applications, etc. The reason, um, now your water heater in your attic or your, or your garage or whatever would actually probably be a great deal more, well, it's, at least a little bit more, probably a great deal more efficient if you uh, were to use a, a spherical water heater rather than a cylindrical. The only problem with that is it's much more expensive to manufacture a spherical tank than it is a cylindrical tank. A cylindrical tank, especially one without even curved ends like a water heater, all you got to do is take a piece of uh, sheet metal, roll it in a tube and put and weld some end caps on it. It's really quick and cheap to manufacture. Now, I'm sure if you had all the money in the world and really cared about energy efficiency, you could probably get someone to make you a spherical water tank, but it would cost a good bit of money, probably more than you're going to ever save in gas bills. So anyway. So let us look at the spherical vessel. And first, let me make sure this thing's still recording. Yep, such high production values in this class. Can you imagine if they did that during the newscast? Just like uh, every so often they just stop the newscast and just be like, let's make sure we're still broadcasting. Okay, so let's look at the spherical vessel. Yes, we're doing it live. <laughs> um, for those who know what I'm referencing, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so what is special about the uh, spherical pressure vessel is that there is no preferred direction. There is no longitudinal, there is no um, hoop, there's just stress. So we can still consider a, a, um, a hoop stress if we wish, but really there's nothing special about any particular axis. So I'm going to still do a cut just at any plane along the sphere. It'll all look exactly the same. So let's consider this. Um, I'm going to have my A1 again. My A1, actually sorry, this is my, my A2. my A2, and then my A1, my A2, and the pressure and the four, oh, sorry, the, the pressures or and stresses on this, again, are going to be very similar. On the outside, we're going to have sig what we're going to call sigma L along the metal itself, along the material itself, doesn't, I guess you could, I suppose we could make a pressure vessel out of ceramic or something. I don't think that'd be a very good idea. Usually those have very poor tensile stresses, but I'm supposed if you want to do, wanted to create a, a ceramic pressure vessel just to prove a point, I guess you could. Don't know why you would, but I guess you could. So maybe you could, or I guess you could make one out of plastic, if, although I really wouldn't recommend that. That's going to get you in trouble. Um, P. You could probably make a, as long as the pressure was, heck, heck, you could probably even make a pressure vessel out of concrete if you were uh, using very low pressures. Um, huh? Target balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
like some sort of beach ball or something like that, yeah. Okay. I guess a beach ball is a pressure vessel, just not a very high pressure vessel. And, uh, I mean, we could make beach balls out of steel, but they wouldn't perform very well. <laughs> oh. Okay, so some of the forces in the longitudinal direction is going to be, um, well, it's going to be the same as before, and so I can just t tell you that um, you can work through the derivation if you want, but it's really the exactly it's really exactly the same as the longitudinal stress in the um, cylindrical case, and it's just p pressure r internal over t two uh, t, and this is actually equal to the hoop stress as well. Sigma h. It's a really bad, poorly drawn box, but oh well. Okay. So consider the state of stress here on the spherical pressure vessel. This is kind of interesting. Oh, did you get that? Okay, good, good. Um, spherical vessel state of stress. Spherical vessel state of stress. So I'm going to have the same kind of element, stress element, and it's going to be like this. Now, it's going to be kind of interesting in that we're going to have the same stress in each of the axes. Hmm. So sigma h is equal to sigma l. Sigma l and sigma l here. And so our Mohr circle is not even a circle anymore, it's just a dot. We don't have a Mohr circle anymore, we have a Mohr's dot. Because our sigma 1 is equal to our sigma 2. Sigma and ta. So all we just have is a single Sigma H or Sigma L. It's just a single point. That's all the more circle is. So what this means is there is no tau. There is no shear stress. So you don't always have to have shear stress. There is no shear stress present at all in this system. No plane is in shear. So it will. If this thing will fail, it's gonna. If there is no preferred failure plane. It can fail at any plane. Um, whatsoever. So in other words, uh, okay, so previously I said that a cylindrical pressure vessel would fail um, along its axis. It would fail, it would form a crack, a longitudinal crack along its axis because it's failing in hoop stress. But what about a cylindrical pressure, uh, what, sorry, what about a spherical pressure vessel? If I have a big hollow sphere and I just keep pumping in gas until it fails, which way is it going to fail? Well, fundamentally, we can't predict it. With a cylinder, we can predict that it's going to be longitudinal. But um, now this does not mean that, that spherical pressure vessels can take an infinite amount of stress. They obviously cannot. They cannot. You can't just keep pumping in gas as high as you want. No, what's going to happen is they're going to form a failure plane or a crack at any arbitrary, at some random, seem, well, at least seemingly random, um, some seemingly random direction. What's, although it won't be random at all, what will, what will, what will, I cannot talk. What it will really be determined by is that um, we treat materials as uh, homogeneous. We treat them as um, as if they have. Uh, we treat them as isotropic. We say they have um, pro the same properties in all directions. But every material, every real material, aside from some sort of science fiction ideal single crystal, monocrystal uh, metal or something like that, every real material that we make has microscopic flaws in it, or even or even nanoscopic flaws, tiny little defects in the crystalline structure. And as you pressurize that thing, and you, even, even if there were no defects, there are going to be slight differences in the thickness at each at any given location. And so even if you could somehow make a perfect material with no flaws whatsoever, it would simply fail at the thinnest point, and it would fail along the thinnest axis, or something like that. 
a true you we draw the when we do the this, when we work through the equations of this class we are assuming idealized objects uh, materials that have no defects materials that have um, no preferred axes that we're treating them as ideal materials in reality the real world doesn't work that way obviously and so it would simply fail based on the microstructure of the metal okay but that's neither here nor there We'll get back to our nice friendly world of um, isotropic materials and homogeneous materials with no defects and everyone is happy forever okay so let us consider example one a cylindrical pressure vessel actually i'm just going to do one example for this i think you can figure out the, the um, spherical so i'm going to work through an example of a cylindrical pressure vessel Example, or as some some may, uh, as some people somewhere may pronounce it, example, or example. I don't know. Someone somewhere may pronounce it that way. I don't know. So we're gonna have A36 steel, good strong American steel, with a sigma y of 36 ksi. Well, this wouldn't be that particularly strong for in terms of steel but whatever um, you've been they've been making this stuff since the 30s maybe even earlier um, okay so the diameter the outer diameter of this pipe we're gonna have a um, cylindrical pressure vessel cylindrical pressure vessel and the outer diameter is going to be six feet or 72 inches. The thickness is going to be two inches and the, inter and the pressure inside is going to be 1200 PSI. So all of this is Guyven. And we want to find Guyven and find um, the factor of safety against yielding or also known as given and find but you know um, the factor of safety against yielding so in other words how close is this thing to yielding but now as we've learned from our um, previous explorations this doesn't mean that it's going to fail or at least it doesn't mean it's going to um, this doesn't mean that it's going to absolutely um, break in two, but it's going to be beyond our yield stress. So anyway, but they can still be it can still be defined as failure, even if the object isn't just completely tearing itself to pieces. OK, so I'm going to work through the solution, assuming a cylindrical pressure vessel. And I think after that, I actually will work through a solution based on a spherical pressure vessel. So solution. Um, actual is less than or equal to allowable that's what we remember how I told you we were going to work on see this uh, again and again and again well here it is actual is less than or equal to allowable and so first we're going to check if um, this is a thin wall pressure vessel um, we need to make sure our we, we have the equations for thin wall pressure vessels and we need to actually make sure our assumption is valid first because as we've seen the thin wall pressure vessel um, equations have certain assumptions based into them and if we do not check this we may actually be working with a thick wall pressure vessel and if it were we can't use this analysis we'd have to use more advanced forms of analysis which we haven't learned yet check if this is a thin wall pressure vessel okay in other words is r over t greater than or equal to 10. okay so let's do that not really that difficult okay 72 inches over 2 remember we're doing it based on radius divided by 2 inches is 18 and this is very comfortably uh, greater than 10 so we're okay good it is indeed a thin wall pressure vessel so our assumptions are valid our thin wall pressure vessel equations will be reasonably accurate um, next we're going to do check actual versus allowable
And I am going to use the uh, hoop stress. I'm not even um, going to bother looking at the longitudinal stress because I already know, because of the, I, because of what I know about thin wall pressure vessels, that the um, maximum stress is going to occur on the hoop stress. So I'm not going to do more circle or anything like that. I'm simply going to say sigma max is equal to sigma h is equal to p r internal over t equals 1200 psi, 1200 pounds per square inch, times 72 inches over 2, minus 2 inches, because we want to work with the internal radius, divided by 2 inches, and all of this then is equal to 20,400 psi. And this is the actual stress. This is sigma actual. And then sigma allowable The allowable stress here is going to be the yield stress over the factor of safety, which is 36,000 PSI divided by the factor of safety. And so we set them equal to each other. Um, sigma actual is less than or equal to sigma allowable. And we get that. Um, we can find that uh, 20,400 is less than or equal to um, 36,000 over the factor of safety. So the factor of safety on this thing is actually 1.76, which is, well, I'm not sure exactly what the accept, uh, acceptable factors of safety are on pressure vessels. Um, but I do know that when you're actually designing serious pressure vessels, you, you um, that is not something done lightly. Usually, you have to follow an entirely separate design code. There's this, there's an entirely separate, uh, a very old code that goes back. It was one of, the, it was one of the first codes that was actually created. It's the uh, pressure vessels and steam boilers code, and um, the reason, and that they're actually very tightly regulated by law in terms of how you can um, design these things, because uh, and, and historically they're, they're actually one of the very first things that required engineering um, uh, calculations, and uh, they, they're the very, one of the very first things that required um, uh, certification by qualified engineers, and that's because way back in the 19th century there were a whole bunch of high-profile um, cases of uh, just random people, workers, people in their homes, um, all sorts of people being injured by and killed by steam boilers. I mean, a uh, a pressure vessel when it fails, it fails. It can fail quite spectacularly. I mean, if you have a um, a pressure vessel that is failing, I mean, you don't have just a failure. You have a bomb. Literally, it's a bomb. It's going, or in some cases, in the case of a in the case of water tanks, or say like water heaters. Um, the reason they have, um, uh, based on, I'm going to do the same thing based on spherical vessels here. The reason water tanks have actually multiple um, safety valves. Um, water tanks, your common domestic water heater, has actually two or three safety valves on it, and that's based on law. And what the way those work is, if the pressure inside the tank ever exceeds a certain critical value, a valve will pop, a spring-activated valve will pop, and that is designed that that valve will pop well before the, uh, and, and still so release some of the steam, and that valve will pop well before the material is going to fail. And the reason for that is historically what's happened is uh, often, um, you know, water heaters were located on the ground floor or in basements or something like that. And often they would, if they fail along their base, you now don't have just have a bomb, you have a rocket. And this thing will actually, the water heaters without their safety valves are just rockets waiting to go off in certain cases. And they, there, there were several cases, several prominent cases of these water heaters just launching themselves upward. And they just, uh, launch, they would just go straight through the floors and rooftops above them, go 200 feet in the air. And if you, if you were unfortunate enough to be between the water heater and the sky above, well, you're going to the moon, yeah. So uh, you're in a bad time, in for a bad time. 
So anyway, uh, pressure vessels can be very dangerous. There's a uh, uh, just any old civil or mechanical engineer can't design them. You actually need very special training and certification to be qualified to, to actually design a pressure vessel in real life. So we're uh, learning. We, I mean, we learn the basics right here, but when you actually get into the complex, get into real world world design, you get into a lot of very complex, um, very complex calculations. Especially when you start talking about things like, okay. Um, how are the different pieces, the different plates that make the, the the boiler connected together? How are the fittings attached? Things like that. How are the how are the pipes going into these things attached? Like uh, we're dealing with very idealized systems, but when you actually start go getting into the nitty gritty, it's very complicated. But we're in the world of happy uniform stresses, so we're not going to worry about that. We we have uniform stresses, happy stresses, happy trees. Okay. So we're going to do the same kind of thing again. Our old friend actual is less than or equal to allowable. It's less than or equal to out allowable. Sigma actual is going to be equal to the sigma max, which is just going to be, well, there is no really, there is really no such thing as hoop or longitudinal. There's just stress here. P R internal over 2T which is 1200 PSI times 72 inches per inch minus two inches over two times two inches. And this comes to um, 10,200 PSI. Okay, and then um, sigma allowable is again equal to the sigma yield, the yield stress over the factor of safety, which is again the same 36,000 PSI over the factor of safety. And so we're going to have 10,200 PSI is less than or equal to 36,000 PSI over FS, and therefore FS will be 3.52. So look, uh, again, um, we've talked about this a little bit again before, but um, so you might be guessing, you might be, uh, you might be asking yourself, why not just use spherical always? Because um, clearly, I mean, look at this. The um, for the same thickness of material, for the same thickness of um, for the same thickness of um, wall, the same wall thickness. Not only can we hold more material, we can actually have a factor of safety almost twice as high, actually exactly twice as high. So we could actually get away with having. Um, we could actually dramatically cut the thickness of the material, and and use us and you if we used a spherical pressure vessel. Well, like I mentioned, this is where it comes down to that um, real world engineering is not always limited by engineering calculations. Our, um, our engineering analysis, our stress analysis, would suggest that the most efficient way to build a pressure vessel is a sphere. But when you actually start constructing things, you find that, oh man, this is actually not the cheapest way to build something. Because if you've ever tried to make something, have, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to make something spherical, but it's not an easy task. Imagine trying to actually make a, a spherical pressure vessel. You can use different methods. You could cast it as a liquid, as a sphere, but that's difficult. You could use some sort of a stamped metal process in a, in a big hydraulic press with spherical uh, with a spherical mold but even that's going to be problematic that's going to have a lot of problems that you can only you can only use stamp processes to such a degree and spherical things are going to be quite difficult um, stamp things are, are a very good thing for things like uh, stamp metal parts things like car doors stuff like that um, but when you start talking about a big sphere that, that's gonna your metal is probably I don't I don't know enough about the stamp metal process whether to say whether it will work or not but um, a hydraulic press like that, it might just break the metal before it could actually stamp it into a spherical pressure vessel. But anyway, and also 
stamping a thing that a big pressure vessel might be problematic. But anyway, so that's neither here nor there. But basically what it comes down to is the reason we don't use spherical pressure vessels for everything, it simply comes down to cost. It is very costly to manufacture spherical objects. It simply is. So anyway, um, so that'll do it. And in the next part of the lecture, we will look at fatigue.